highlights that stick in my mind about that. You know, each of the teams, after five years of preparation and all this hype and bullshit, the teams were finally arriving a few days before the start of the tournament and, and each of the teams were progressively coming in. And the last team to arrive was the team from Tonga. And Tonga's got a, quite a significant community in Auckland and we've been working with the Tonga community. And on a Monday afternoon, about four o'clock, um, the Tonga team arrived at Auckland Airport and, and um, this huge Tonga community, about seven or 8,000 went out to, to greet them. And it was absolutely fantastic because they took their cars with them, they couldn't find car parking, they parked them on the Southern Motorway and brought the whole Southern Motorway to a, to a halt. <laughs> now I've had guys working for five years on traffic management and risk management and not one of the buggers had thought of this, the better. So, um, I think the sight of that on, on network TV at 6 o'clock that night um, and just the joy of the Tongan community in New Zealand welcoming in their, their national team. Because these various communities around New Zealand, they are New Zealanders, but they also have this, this love of where they've come from and, and Rugby World Cup was able to bring so many of these teams in that were able to hook up with, with uh, Kiwis that had strong connections with those countries and it was lovely putting those together and just the colour and the vibrancy of it and that, that first afternoon on the motorway really set people off and, and made them realise I think it was going to be fun. And then uh, a couple of weeks later at Eden Park, ground was chock a block, Ireland were playing Australia, we had been asking people to support all of these other 19 teams, not just our team. And one of the ways of doing that was dressing up in the colours of the other teams. And so this night, 60,000 people at Eden Park, one of the biggest crowds ever, and just about everyone dressed up in the colours of the two teams. There was at least 1,000 in the yellow of the Wallabies, and 50-something thousand in Emerald Green and Wild. <laughs> and inside, inside the stadium, it felt like you were in Dublin. And the Irish were underdogs for this game, and they just played out of their skins. And they won a famous victory, and at the end of the match, the, the Sky TV guys run on and they grab the Irish captain um, and interview him. Of course, he's absolutely Brian Driscoll, an absolute great at the game, but he's a standard at this victory. And they said, how do you feel? It's one of those really insightful questions they think about <laughs> for ages beforehand. And he looked up at, at the grandstands and he said, I'm just so grateful for all of those people that have made the trip out from Ireland to support us tonight. <laughs> Yeah, most of them are from Mount Eden and I'm sure at that time. And the next night they'll put on red and sport whales and whale will go again. But that was just a lovely touch of how New Zealanders really embraced it. Um, there was a game in Palmerston North between Georgia and Romania, the Royal Powerhouses of World Rugby. And um, uh, what they do in Palmerston North, the home team normally here is Manawa or two and they play in green. And there's a university, the Massey University, and the students some years ago created this um, uh, tradition of turning up to the matches with green buckets on their heads. I don't know why, but it took off. Um, so before this match, the mayors of, of Palmerston North and the surrounding districts got together, and the mayor of Palmerston North, Joan O'Neill, who's now in Parliament, said, uh, We, Palmerston North, we will support uh, Romania, and the rest of you, you support. Uh, Georgia. So the colours are green and yellow. So they went out and they bought about 8,000 buckets of these two colours and handed them out to the crowd as they were going in. And it was a full crowd, but it's still a small ground, so there's only about 10,000 people there with 8,000 buckets on their heads. <laughs> I was there. And I was looking out and I was thinking, what must it be like for people on the other side of the world? Just early hours of the morning, the alarm clock's gone off, they've turned on TV, the cameras are panning, and all the crowd. It's got buckets on the <laughs> And I guess they're thinking, oh, well, this game's in Palmerston North tonight. <laughs> One of the lovely experiences was driving around the North Island and I got lost. None of the so far has got anything to do with that old immunisation, and I promise you I will come back to this. But um, I was driving from Rotorua down to, I think it was to Palmerston or New Plymouth, and I got absolutely lost. I had GPS working and I couldn't work out how to follow it. And I ended up in the middle of, of the tent country, just pure rural area. Came across a tiny little town called Bennydale. Have you ever heard of Bennydale? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One main street. Three shops, I think. 20 lampposts. All three shops covered in the flags 
of the tournament. The lampposts hang off each of these lampposts a hand-painted mural, each one of them depicting one of the teams in the tournament. And here we are. I don't know what population of Benidale, I guess it'd be about six or seven. Um, and I thought, you know, this tournament has really been embraced by New Zealanders uh, when it's got that far. So, you know, that was, I have to say, Rugby World Cup was um, a, a lovely, lovely experience. And cricket's been fun too. Um, and as he said, the, the recent Cricket World Cup, uh, you know, particularly the match against Australia and the, the, the semi final against South Africa, which is unbelievable sort of experiences that replicated a lot of what Rugby World Cup did. And again, it showed New Zealanders coming together and just, just rising to the occasion. And that was a co-hosted co tournament between New Zealand and Australia, and both, both countries did, did brilliantly with it. It was really fitting that we both got into the final. And it wasn't you know, a pleasant memory of the final particularly, but you cannot help but be proud of, of what our team did and how the effect and the impact it had on the quality of the tournament, I think, and the impact it had on people watching around the world who suddenly you know, had been ho-hum about cricket, but the way our team played and the underdog status rising to the, to the occasion really drew them into it. And, uh, you know, we could be really proud of what they did. Um, so, moving on to immunisation. <laughs> um, I'm pretty healthy. Um, I've been lucky, really. Uh, not as healthy as I should be, but, but still healthy enough. Um, last year, um, I had what I can now tell you was an attack of shingles. Um, anyone had shingles? Yeah. Pleasant? No, not pleasant. Um, I actually thought I was having a heart attack. Um, my, my family said that my dad, but my family does have heart problems. And I sort of was having all these really sharp pains, and I thought, this is going to be something to do with my heart. So I went along to my GP, and, and he um, did all sorts of tests and at the end of it he said you're a millimeter, you better go home. Um, no, he was kinder than that. But um, he said I can't, can't find anything, I, so I don't know what's causing it, so just go home. And then about an hour later he rang me up and he said I've just arranged for you to go and see a heart specialist um, that afternoon. So I shot up and had all sorts of tests by him. And he said no, you're a millimeter, go home. Um, and so I had no idea the end of the day, what it was, was still feeling uh, all of the same pain, was quite worried about it. Uh, next morning woke up, had a rash, meant nothing to me, but my wife saw it um, and said shingles. Now, I'd heard the word shingles, but I didn't really know what it was. I had no contemplation whatsoever of how um, painful it was. And, and then, of course, over the next few weeks, and, and even though I was but lucky in that got into the medication uh, in an early sense, which seemed to, to do a lot of good. It was still a long and difficult process, um, and I'm one of the lucky ones, because of course once you've got someone, you get onto the web and have a look, and you see some of the photographs that you see around shingles, and man, you don't want to look. Um, but anyway, I went through that process. In the middle of it, um, I know that the GP talked to me a little bit about vaccination, but I think I probably wasn't in the frame of mind to listen. Um, and so it never really registered properly with me. I was just more interested in getting the medication and getting it right and, and moving on with life. And so at the end of it, I probably didn't have a proper download with them about it, and then just, you know, move on with life. And then um, I got this invitation to talk tonight about three months ago, I think, and I said to him, man, I'm going to need a bit of help with this. It's not a topic that easily runs off the, the tongue for me. And so, yeah. So I talked to Maureen um, Dawson about it, and she sent me a bit of stuff, and I started reading about it. And then a few weeks ago, I went along to the G my local GP, and this is a new one, because I shifted from Wellington to Auckland. First, so it's the first time I met him. And um, so I was just getting a few things tested, just to make sure I was all right. And, and then I said to him, um, oh, I'm talking at this, this um, medical conference coming up soon um, about adult immunisation. And he said, oh yeah. And uh, 
he said, do you know how smallpox was, was cured? And I said, no. He said, have you ever heard of a guy called Edward Jenner? And I thought, I had heard of Edward Jenner, but I took no notice of it and didn't. didn't. And he said to me, well, this was 300 years ago or whatever, that this guy um, had brains. Smallpox was rampant in England, Europe, I suppose, and uh, no one knew what to do. And then he just happened to notice one day that people in his town who had been suffering from cowpox, it was in presumably a rural area, I suppose, because there were cows there, um, <laughs> and he just somehow thought people who are having cowpox aren't suffering from smallpox. So he thought, maybe there's a leak. And so he started sort of fiddling around with it, and then he thought, I'd like to trial this. But I'd imagine, you know, smallpox was a killer, an absolute killer, so, you know, testing was going to be a, a little bit tricky. And when you read about it, he actually spent quite a lot of time trying to find a guinea pig. And finally, he persuaded some guy to allow him to, to test with his son, very brave the father, to offer the son instead of himself. And he, um, so he, he made sure this guy was infected with cowpox first, um, and then waited for him to recover from that. And then he cut him, put smallpox in there, and then um, saw what happened. Now, if it had gone wrong, he would have been charged with murder. Um, it didn't go wrong, fortunately for him, and he became a hero. And actually, uh, from there, people stood up and took notice started doing something about it, and, and as you know, 